Welcome to our live virtual event today entitled Updates in Breast Health and Breast Cancer Risk Reduction. Before we get started, we want to emphasize that your health is our top priority, and we remain committed to providing you with the highest quality primary and specialty care today and always. We want you to be assured that when you come to one of our Valley Medical Group practices or the hospital for care, your ex experience will be a safe one. We have established a safe visit protocol that is in effect at all of our Valley Medical Group offices as well as the hospital. For our folks tuning in from home, if at any time you have questions, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A portal located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please feel free to submit questions anytime during the presentation. And for all of us, those that are here in person, and for those at home, we'll have time after the presentation's over to address some of these questions. Towards the bottom of the email after the presentation you received from the community health at valleyhealth.com, uh, which included the link to join this meeting, you will find another link um, taking you to a survey monkey. For those of you sitting in our audience today, you receive a paper copy of the evaluation. Um, after the presentation, please take a moment to complete the anonymous survey about this program. Your feedback is very important to us. Most live events, including this one, will be recorded and posted on the website. For a listing of videos on other health topics, please visit www.valleyhealth.com slash tune into health. We will be updating the site frequently with new videos. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Dr. Laura Klein is a director of our breast center for uh, Valley Medical Group. She also serves as a clinical assistant professor um, of medicine for the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Eleanor Toplinski is the head of the breast medical oncology department for Valley Medical Group. She is also a clinical assistant professor of medicine for the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Jessica Cording is a registered dietitian and health coach with the Valley Hospital. She is the author of the little book of Game Changers, 50 Healthy Habits for Managing Stress and Anxiety. So we'll start off with Dr. Klein and she'll also introduce some of her staff. Thank you. I wanted to just introduce the other members of my team. We can't be what we are without our entire team. Um, so Dr. Maura Christudius, she is my associate. She is also a breast surgeon. Um, why don't you guys just all kind of come up here? All right, Elizabeth Horowitz is one of our clinicians. She is a physician assistant by title. She sees our patients that are in the survivorship group as well as high risk. Uh, Shanti Koshi Thomas is also a physician assistant, part of our team. And Geraldine Redman is also one of our clinicians in the high risk and survivorship care team. And then I should let you introduce your two people. Come. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so this is our breast surgery team, and I'll just introduce some key, uh, some members of our medical oncology team. Not everyone could be with us today, and we have a very big team that would not be allowed in this space. Um, but we do have Dr. Amanda Podolsky, who's our other breast and GYN medical oncologist, and Alana Fishman, who is our breast uh, uh, nurse practitioner, and she really runs our survivorship program in the medical oncology space. I want to start off by going through some scenarios of what screening for breast cancer is. Screening for breast cancer is not only the imaging that you receive, but also the awareness, self-breast exam, and clinical breast exam. So first, of course, the obligatory uh, beginning here. One in eight women will have breast cancer if they live to be 85 years old. So it is important if you're sitting amongst a room of all of us, somebody in this room will have breast cancer or a few somebodies. We have data from 2017 where we have an estimated 3 million survivors of breast cancer that are living, thriving, 
And it's important, that's a very important number for me because this is why I come to work every day. I feel like what we have to offer in terms of local control and systemic control, in other words, survival, is um, much greater than it ever has been in history. There is an estimated 200,000 plus patients that will be diagnosed a year. 40,000 deaths per year, that number I'm hoping will be shrinking and shrinking. And we can't forget about the men. 1% of men will have breast cancer as well. When should I get a mammogram? This is one of the biggest topics that we speak about amongst our colleagues in internal medicine and cardiology, people, OBGYN, people who are asking us, when do we start? What are the guidelines? There are so many different guidelines and there's a lot of mixed messages. The center here in the middle, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN guidelines are our, you can call it our Bible. We go to this and this is what our buzzwords are for our patients that starting at the age of 40 and yearly as long as you are in good health and that's for an average risk patient. So again, self breast exam. This has been taken out of the recommendations for, from Komen, from the American Cancer Society, but from my perspective, you have hands, you can know your body, knowing your body is the best. I have to tell you that I probably have never had a patient show up for a regular yearly clinical breast exam and said, oh, did you know that you had this lump here? Most of the time, people are calling up and saying, hey, doc, I feel something. Can I come in and see you? Or when they do come in for their yearly, it is an opportunity for them to then present to me and say, you know, I felt something over here. Can you really take a look at this and focus in on it? So self-breast exam is important, and I do advocate for that. Otherwise, a clinical breast exam, starting at the age of 20, every three years till the age of 39, and then yearly beginning at the age of 40. Mammography, again, beginning at the age of 40. And we can consider ultrasound as an addition for dense breasts. Screening guidelines are augmented for women who are above average risk. So the above average risk women are people who have a family history of breast cancer, that's a first degree relative, parent, sibling, or child, history of atypical hyperplasia that was found on biopsy, lobular carcinoma in situ, mantle radiation from treatment for Hodgkin's disease, or a genetic predisposition. When a person is at an increased risk, then working with your clinician or your breast surgeon is important to really develop an individualized plan for augmented screening and augmented examination. We can't forget other signs and symptoms. This is also part of the screening for breast cancer, that when we look at ourselves in the mirror every day, is there a new lump? Has something changed with the nipple? Is there redness? Has there new firmness? Has something changed? Is there discharge? Non-cancerous conditions of the breast can also be found in, in those types of findings when you're looking at yourself or when you're doing your breast exam. So don't just jump to breast cancer. Lumpiness, thickening, swelling are all signs and symptoms of fibrocystic disease, fibrocystic changes, um, normal menstrual cycles, changes that happen postmenopausal, fatty involution of the breast, cysts are fluid-filled lumps, those are also very common. Fibroadenomas are solid benign tumors. Infections can happen if something hurts suddenly, if it's warm to the touch, if you have fevers or chills, and of course a trauma. I had a patient come into the office the other day. She had a complete seatbelt strap across her chest. I want to review the anatomy of the breast quickly because when we speak about screening, it will help everything make sense about what we're looking for in the breast. The female breast anatomy, looking from the side, the breast is predominantly fat and skin. The lobules of the breasts have ducts that lead out to the nipple, and the lobules are the milk factories of the breast. They're arranged like spokes of a wheel all radiating towards the center, and there are multiple lobules, eight to 10 sections that are highly branching and overlapping. These are broken up into lobes, lobules, the ducts carry the milk, 
and the ducts all join together to form larger ducts. So when we're talking about disease, we're thinking about what this network of ducts is looking like on a mammogram. And sometimes what we see are various areas in the breast that are involved with disease. However, they're usually only a disease of one ductal system. Patients will come in and they'll say, you know, I have this disease all over my breast stock. You know, what's going on? Is it spreading? I say, no, it's really just one of these ductal lobular systems that is involved. It just happens to be arborizing like the branches of a tree. If we take out one of these ductal lobular systems and look at it in cross section, a duct is lined with normal ductal epithelial cells. These are the origin of breast cancer. These cells can increase in size, increase in shape. They can still look normal and do that. That's normal hyperplasia, happens every month, happens with pregnancy. But when these cells start becoming funny looking, different shapes and sizes and piling up inside of the lumen of the duct, this is when we start identifying it as disease. And the funny thing that happens and why we can identify this early is these funny looking cells outgrow their blood supply. The body comes and tries to gobble up those cells as if they're getting rid of the dead and dying tissue and it replaces it with calcium. The calcium is then radio opaque and that's what we're looking for for an early diagnosis on a mammogram. The picture down at the bottom here is the idea of when these cells gain the ability to live outside of the duct of the breast and can live in the surrounding fatty tissue outside of the main ductal system, that's when we use the word invasive carcinoma. It does not mean that the disease is invading through the body. It means it has invaded through the basement membrane of the duct and now is creating disease in the breast, localized to the breast. And if you go for your yearly screening mammography, most likely you will be identified as having the disease as, at the earliest possible chance when it is treatable and curable. Again, just another picture. And this is the picture of the cells coming out of the duct. And now let's talk about breast imaging, what we're, what we're here for in this lecture anyway. So screening, again, starts at the age of 40, annually thereafter, as long as you're asymptomatic. There are two words that we use when you go for your screening mammogram or for breast imaging. One is screening, the other is a diagnostic workup. A diagnostic workup is used when a person has a complaint. If there's a lump, if there's discharge, if there's pain, if I feel something, then that screening exam is converted to diagnostic. Now what that means, boots on the ground, is is the radiologist currently there? Are they present? Are they looking at the film? Is the tech coming back and forth and having a conversation with the radiologist? Do you see everything you need to see? Is there anything there? And do we need anything in addition? So additional imaging, we will also talk about a bit. The standard views are the cranial caudal and the medial lateral oblique. Cranial caudal views are able to look at a 2D where we're seeing what is lateral near the axilla or the armpit and what is medial. And that's all we can tell is what's side to side and from the most posterior aspect of the breast to the most anterior aspect of the breast. The medial lateral oblique tells us what is down and what is up and gives us a shot of the axilla. For those of you who have had a mammogram, when you raise your arm like this and you have the diagnostic mammogram sending the x-rays in this direction, you get that view and you can get a little snapshot of what might be happening in that location. A picture of a woman actually getting a mammogram. And then how do we know when the radiologist is looking at this? How do we know the radiologist at Valley can communicate with the radiologist in Manhattan and to the breast surgeons that are sitting in the office by a lexicon? It's a series of words and definitions that have been created and agreed upon amongst our society to help us understand what that mammogram is telling us. It's called the Breast Imaging and Reporting Data System. And it gives us an idea by these categories or scores of how likely this mammogram is to show us something that is a problem, something that needs further workup, 
needs a biopsy, or is highly suspicious for breast cancer, or the opposite, is absolutely normal, come back next year. A zero means I can't really tell, I need more information, come on back and let me do some additional pictures, maybe with mammography, maybe with ultrasound, or poten potentially MRI as well. A one is normal, a two is benign. And I have a lot of people who come in and say to me, well, probably benign or benign, but it has this very low chance of still having cancer. So what do we do with that? This can really throw people into a tailspin. But look at these numbers. These numbers are very small. And if you think about the number of people going for routine screening mammography, if you have 1,000 people, only 10% of those people will be called back for additional findings. And only 0.05% of people will have breast cancer that are screened. So we're looking for these tiny, tiny numbers. And this is a screening modality. It's inexpensive. It's accessible to most people. A three is given to people who the radiologist does not want to give them a pass, does not want to let them go the full year, but they want them to come back in a shorter interval. So this number is still small for likelihood of malignancy between 0.3 and 1.8. So they get a BIRAD category three, an invitation to come back in six months. A four means you need a biopsy. A five means you really need a biopsy, and this is probably cancer until proven otherwise. And a six is additional workup in a known cancer. So what are those additional views? Additional views can be compression views. Some of you have probably had this paddle. This is a paddle that compresses tissue so that it can help squish out the overlapping layers. It puts more of that compression there and helps the radiologist to see a clearer picture. Magnification views is used when we're looking at calcifications. Calcifications come with different morphologies, different forms. Some of those forms are absolutely normal and benign, and you can find them in most women's breasts. But we're looking for a very particular shape, size, and grouping that lead us to believe that there may be an underlying problem. And even if you have these, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's cancer. It just means you need something more. This is a slide of calcifications that we use the term malignant calcifications. And it gives us an idea, not an absolute, but an idea of the extent of disease that we're dealing with. This is that BIRAD category five, spiculated mass. When we see this on a mammogram, it is a cancer until proven otherwise. Now, who needs an ultrasound? Ultrasound has been very controversial and during my time here at Valley, which is about 12 plus years, I saw this state adopt a bill that's the dense breast bill. And that bill allowed the wording to be put in every single mammogram that if you should have dense breasts, that you need to have a conversation with your physician to discuss the benefit of the adjunct of ultrasound to your yearly screening because mammography fails people with very dense breasts. It doesn't mean you can just leave it on the table and not go for your mammography. It just means you need something more, that the addition of the additional imaging will be helpful and raise that specificity and sensitivity. So it's a, it's a conversation. We use it as an adjunct in women with dense breasts. We can sometimes detect early stage cancers that are not seen on mammogram in those women with dense breasts. We do not like to use it in women with fatty type of breasts. It doesn't give us much information that we don't already get from the mammography. Um, it's often the go-to when you have an architectural distortion or one of the findings that the radiologists want to do further workup in. And what it does is it distinguishes solid versus cystic. The ultrasound will look black in the center if it's a cystic mass, and it will look fuzzy in the center if it's a solid mass. And this is to varying degrees, as well as some other shadowing that we can see around that gives us an idea of the malignant potential and if the person needs a biopsy. 
this is a difference between a mammogram mass, this is a fibroadenoma, and a fibroadenoma, which is a benign disease of the breast that does not turn into cancer. Um, and this is how it looks on ultrasound. It has all this gray fuzziness inside. And again, this is a mammographic view of a mass and the ultrasonographic view of the mass with these internal, what we call shadows. And this is a Doppler flow so we can see how vascular it is. Cancers are vascular. So it helps us to understand what might be going on and helps us to make a recommendation for biopsy. I'm going to speed up here pretty quickly. Um, MRI is another adjunct examination. And here's the big question. Everybody today should have a 3D mammogram. The day that 3D, or tomosynthesis of the breast, was approved in the country and FDA approved, Valley went all tomo, practically the next day. We were positioning for this, and we didn't do it in a small way. We went completely tomo. So it wasn't like we were thinking, all right, we can do a little bit like this and a little bit like that. The 3D mammogram is the gold standard today, in my opinion, and many others, because it does have an increased detection of cancer. And that's why we're all here. That's why we all show up. Film screen is where we started, and you would get these awful pictures. Digital took that to a gr next level, and we were all digital, again, the day that digital was approved. Valley likes to stay a on the forefront of technology. And digital now compared to 3D, the same mass that you cannot appreciate by digital mammography, you can appreciate as a speculated mass on 3D. And what's going on here? What we're doing is like a CAT scan. We're doing slices. And the machine of the mammography unit swings across the breast in an arc and acquires multiple images with a low dose of x-ray. And then a computer then brings it all together and you can scroll through it. So you remove all of those slices of overlapping tissues. Basically, you're getting those compression views without having additional compression. And this all happens very quickly. And again, you can see the spiculated mass on the 3D where you might just gloss right over it in the 2D. So again, increase in detection rate by 40%. That's a huge number. Decrease the callbacks. That means decreased anxiety. If you come for a screening mammogram and you say, I'm in a hurry, I want to show up, get my two Ds, my cranial caudal, my medial lateral oblique, go home, and then you get that letter in the mail inviting you to come back or a phone call. So it decreases that number and that anxiety by 15%. And therefore, it reduces the uncertain readings by 20 to 30%. What do we do when we then have a suspicious area? We biopsy. The gold standard for biopsy and diagnosis is percutaneous needle biopsy. And the rationale for that is that we want a diagnosis, we want to know what's happening, we want a complete understanding of everything, of both breasts, so that we can sit down with patients individually and have a individual discussion and create a plan so that the patient can go home knowing what they need to do next. And I find that especially women are very strong once they know what the diagnosis is and what their plan is. So the breast biopsy. We work together as a team with our radiology colleagues. And at Valley, we are a truly a multidisciplinary group. We have great communication between all of us. I sometimes will get phone calls from our referring physicians and say, you know, I think the patient should see you first to talk about whether this biopsy is necessary. Well, in our program, we have assured that those recommendations are necessary when they're rendered because we do have a team of six to seven fellowship trained breast specialists on our team. And I would never say, no, I don't think that this person's not correct. We have the utmost faith in our team. The types of biopsies that we can perform are FNAs, core needle biopsies, and stereotactic biopsies. The stereotactic biopsy is when we have an image detected 
finding, like calcifications. It's something that we don't feel. Often patients will say, well, I had to have a biopsy. There's something there. It's a diagnosis, perhaps, of DCIS. And how come I don't feel this, doc? And I'll say, well, I don't feel it either. This is an image-detected, screen-detected cancer, which is, again, where we want to find breast cancer because we do believe that early detection means treatable and curable. This is a picture or a slide of the stereotactic machine where a woman lays prone with the breast down below and the needle then is administered below. We can also do it sitting up in an upright or sideways and we have, again, all of the technology to perform the stereotactic biopsies in any one of these positions, which is necessary because everybody's body is not the same. And the position and whether it's towards the front or towards the back are not the same. And so we have all the different machinery so that we can make it as comfortable as possible. When we do a biopsy, it's important that we mark that location for future identification with something called a tissue marker or clip. And since I moved to New Jersey and started practicing in New Jersey, I have had more kickback about having this clip or foreign body. It is not a chip. We are not tracking you. But when you go for your screening mammogram the next year, it does communicate to the radiologist, whether it's here in New Jersey, in New York, in California, that you've had a biopsy, and it allows us then to really drill down on that area and say, okay, there is nothing that is developed here. I see that it's been biopsied before. Nothing has changed. You can go on. Or it's a marker for somebody like myself. If I have to get back to the spot that was biopsied, we don't see the lesions, we don't see the area of concern, so these clips are important for localization. Open biopsy, if we can't get it with the needle, then I have to do my job and take the patient to the operating room to perform an open biopsy, which is a day out of a person's life. I wouldn't say necessarily more discomfort, at least not in Dr. Christudius in my hands. So. Uh, but it is a more expeditious and more correct way to do it with a percutaneous biopsy. Then, Dr. Toplinski, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can reduce our risk. So there's a lot of what Dr. Klein talked about in terms of breast cancer risk, things that are not modifiable getting older, being a woman, when you started getting your menstrual periods, your family history, your genetics, all of those are things that you can't control. But there are a lot of things that we can control, and so that's what I'm going to focus on today. So we're going to really talk about lifestyle factors in terms of risk reduction. And I'm going to break it down into five lifestyle factors. Uh, the most important thing that I want to stress is that you can't prevent breast cancer. So when we talk about Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're in October, you'll see a ton of events, you'll see a ton of stuff about breast cancer prevention. And here's the deal. Nothing that you can do will completely eliminate the chance of getting breast cancer but we can reduce our breast cancer risk, and then once we've been diagnosed, we can also reduce the risk of having a recurrence. And the five factors that we wanna highlight are exercise, alcohol, obesity, vitamin D, and diet and nutrition. So I'm gonna break each of these down a little bit further. Let's start with exercise. Exercise is the best thing that you can do for your body, not just with cancer, but when we talk about our heart health, our bone health, our immune system, and the list goes on. We know that women who are physically active have a lower risk of breast cancer, up to 20% compared to those that are inactive. That is going to translate to a reduced risk both in premenopausal women and in postmenopausal women. Exercise also lowers the risk of breast cancer recurrence and death. And these numbers are crazy. 55% lower chance of having your breast cancer come back and a 68% chance, a lower risk of dying from breast cancer. I mean, that is really more effective than even some of the best treatments that we have. Now, what we hear a lot is, well, I wasn't active before. That's okay. You can start now. There's no... There's no better time to start like the present. What we also hear is, well, I was active and I was still diagnosed with breast cancer. And I, I get that you feel like you did 
everything right and the cancer still happened. But what we know is that people who are exercising even before their breast cancer diagnosis have better outcomes down the road and they will also tolerate the treatment better. So there's multiple benefits in that regard. In terms of what the recommendations are, the American Cancer Society recommends 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity a week. So this is something that's getting your heart rate up. If you're wearing a heart rate monitor, this is going to be about 50, 40, 50% 50 of your maximum heart rate. That's going to translate into a brisk walk, um, bicycling. You know, your heart rate's up, but you're not really working that hard or 75 to 100 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity. So that's running, maybe bicycling, uphill, that kind of thing. Or any equivalent combination of the two. And with the vigorous activity, that's gonna be about 70 to 80% of your maximum heart rate. Now, if you're not wearing a heart rate monitor, that's okay, but sometimes it can be helpful when you're just starting out to get one of them so that you can kind of if you're having a hard time gauging well, what's moderate and what's vigorous, the heart rate monitor can be helpful in that regard. In addition to the cardio piece of it, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans recommend muscle strengthening activity at least two days a week, as well as balance training. And you know you can incorporate that into cardio. So maybe you're walking with weights, maybe you're doing a boot camp class. Um, you know it doesn't have to be all separate. And the balance training is really important because a lot of the medications that we use for breast cancer treatment can damage your bones. And now if you start bringing in the balance, right, that's going to decrease your risk for falls, which can be really important if you already have underlying osteopenia or osteoporosis. And I just really want to highlight quickly, so we're here at the Lifestyles facility, and this is a fantastic, fantastic place. And one of the things that we started doing with the team here at Lifestyles is the Valley PrEP program. And PrEP stands for the Physician Referred Exercise Prescription. And it's done here. And the idea is that a lot of people tell us, I want to exercise. I know how important it is, but I don't know where to start. I'm walking into a gym. I have no idea what equipment I should use. And so you come here. It's a complimentary one-month program for all of our patients who've been diagnosed with breast cancer. And they are going to do a physical assessment. They're going to test your strength your cardio, your balance, flexibility, you name it. And they will hand you a prescription for what you should be doing. So if you want to focus, you know, if your cardio is great, maybe you've got good endurance, but your balance is off, they'll come up with a program that, you know, centers on that. And then you have the ability to use the machines to try out the classes, the equipment. Uh, so this is great. And certainly if you're here or you're watching virtually and you want to take advantage of it, just come talk to us uh, at the end and we can get definitely get you set up. Moving on to obesity. We know that this is a hot topic. You know, years ago, we used to talk about the tobacco epidemic, the smoking epidemic, and now we're really entering the obesity epidemic. And there was an article in Fortune a couple of years ago asking if fat was the next tobacco, meaning, you know, has obesity kind of reached that level of crisis when it comes to our health? And, and it has. We know that women who are overweight or obese after menopause have a 30 to 60 percent higher breast cancer risk than those who are lean. So it's, these are huge numbers. Now, paradoxically, that's actually not the case if you're premenopausal. However, we know that obesity has other detrimental effects. So, but just kind of keep in mind that the data is for obesity in the postmenopausal population. The other part is that gaining weight in adulthood and especially in the menopausal period in, and greater than 20 pounds increases your risk. So even if you're a completely healthy weight, but let's say you go from 120 pounds to 140 and you're still in that normal BMI category, it's that 20 pound weight gain that really increases your risk. Now BMI we know is not the best measure of health by any, way, you know, any means, but it is what we have when we talk about the breast cancer data. A lot of times we get asked, well, exactly how does obesity contribute to breast cancer? And there are a lot of different ways. I do like this graphic because it kind of highlights some of the ways, but I think there's a lot still that we don't understand. 
But the three ways that you'll see here, number one is that when uh, in people who are overweight or obese, they will have more inflammation in the body. Um, and we have this increase in macrophages, which release chemicals called cytokines. And these help with cell growth. They encourage the cancer cells to divide. Additionally, obesity is linked with insulin resistance, and the high levels of insulin in the body contribute to other growth factors, also causing cell growth. And finally, we know that with obesity, you do have more fat cells or more adipose tissue, which is where estrogen is stored. So when we're thinking about our estrogen receptor positive breast cancers that are feeding on estrogen, in a way, more estrogen in the body is going to increase the risk. And again, there are a lot of other mechanisms that we don't yet know, but these are just some of them. So kind of segueing, we're gonna talk right about nutrition. We can spend hours talking about this topic. It's a very hot topic, but I'll kind of sum up what we know. And again, I love this article that you can't starve cancer, but you might help treat it with food. Meaning that what we eat and what we put into our bodies every single day really makes a difference. You know, when we think about taking a medication, if a doctor says to you, you know, I'd like you to take this medication, okay, we go through all of the side effects, all of the risks, all of the benefits, and then we just go eat, you know, processed food right after that and don't think twice about what we put into our body. So I think it's really important to thinking about what are you eating on a day-to-day -day basis. So here is what we know so far. We recommend a plant-forward eating approach as really probably the best option for breast cancer. What is plant-forward eating? It is a style of cooking and eating that emphasizes plant-based foods but it's not strictly limited to them. So you can have your chicken, you can have fish, you can have dairy. But again, most of what you're eating is gonna be in that plant-based category. The big thing is to limit red meats and processed meats. So processed meats is bacon, deli meat, sausages, as well as limiting ultra-processed foods. So these are foods that are associated with a higher cancer risk. They are made mostly from substances extracted from foods such as fats, starches, oils, hydrogenated fats, sugars. So we know what these are. These are your frozen meals. Now, some frozen meals are healthy, but some we know are not. Uh, hot dogs, cold cuts, packaged cookies, fast foods, you know, pretty much everything you see at a child's birthday party, all of those things are going to be kind of that ultra processed. You don't have to eliminate them, but you want to think about them as the food you eat sparingly rather than what you're eating on a day-to-day -day basis. And the problem is that we live in a culture of convenience. We're all busy. It's very easy to grab that package, that fast food meal, but really, really important to look at labels. And Jessica's gonna talk a little bit more about that in her talk in a little bit. We do want to eat more fruits, vegetables, fiber, and whole grains. So that's when we're thinking about kind of the good foods that day-to-day -day stuff for breast cancer, that's what we want to be eating. And I'll touch on and say that soy and phytoestrogens actually have a protective effect on breast cancer. So we always think about soy is not good because it has estrogen and that can feed the breast cancer, but these are plant-based estrogens that are actually good for you and protective. So these, this we're talking about tofu, tempeh, miso, edamame. We're not talking about the processed soy foods, like the soy nuggets and things like that. And a point is that just because something is vegan, it does not mean that it is healthy. Similarly, if you see plant-based on a label, it doesn't mean that it's healthy. So it's really important to look at ingredients and really look at the labels of what we're putting into our body. And I, I like this pyramid. There, you know, there's a lot of food pyramids out there. Uh, there's a lot of kind of proposed things. But this, just to give you an idea of what a whole food plant-based diet pyramid looks like, and you'll see on the bottom, you've got a lot of fruits and vegetables. Then you've got whole grains, leafy green vegetables, and on top, you're going to have legumes, beans, peas, lentils. This is your source of protein, essentially, and then the high-fat whole foods. So those are very good for you, but we still want to eat them in moderation. And I want to be very clear that we are not recommending a... Um, you know, a vegan diet for everybody. Chicken and fish are absolutely fine. We want people to eat those foods. But when you think about what you're eating is you really want to make sure you're getting a lot of plants, you're getting plant-based sources of protein, and you're really focusing on the fruits and vegetables and limiting the processed foods. 
this is recent data, looking at sugar-sweetened beverages. So when you ask someone, well, what's a sugar-sweetened beverage? Everyone's going to tell you the top picture on the left, right? Everyone knows that the Dr. Peppers and the Pepsis and the sodas, they're not good for you. We, we know that. But all of those other drinks also have just as much sugar as those sodas. Chocolate milk, a uh, chai latte from Starbucks, a margarita, a lemonade, an iced tea, right? Things that you would think are well, not that bad for you. They have a ton and ton of sugar. So it's really important when we're thinking about what we're eating and drinking that we keep those th the beverages in, um, in mind too. Now, again, not all sugar is bad for you. The sugar from fruits is fine, but it's that added sugars that we're seeing in some of these drinks that we'd want to limit. In terms of what we know about breast cancer is that there's more and more evidence coming out with regards to breast cancer and sugar-sweetened beverages. Half of Americans drink a sugary beverage on any given day. So think about what you've had to drink today, and I, I'm sure half of us in this room have had something to drink with added sugar in it. But evidence we know is coming out with cardiovascular disease, weight gain, insulin resistance, and diabetes, and now with breast cancer. Multiple studies have shown that consumption of these sugary drinks is associated with a higher breast cancer risk. And there was a study published earlier in the year, and they looked at people... Um, who were consuming sugar-sweetened drinks after their diagnosis of breast cancer, they had a higher rate of dying from breast cancer than they did if they didn't have those drinks. Now, the problem with these studies is they're also not taking into account, well, are these people also exercising or what else are they eating, right? So there's a lot of confounding factors, but it's just something to keep in mind. One question I get asked all the time is what about artificially sweetened beverages? And actually, those have not been shown to be at increased risk. With that said, we still want to have that in moderation, but keeping that in mind. So we talked about how margaritas have a lot of added sugar, so let's touch on alcohol. Alcohol is the breast cancer risk factor that no one wants to talk about. No one wants to you know, kind of say, this is not good for us. Alcohol increases levels of estrogen, and that may explain some of the risk, but the bottom line is we don't still totally know. However, the risk of breast cancer or, or of recurrence appears to increase once you get to three drinks a week. And that's why we always recommend kind of keeping it to three drinks a week or less. What is the actual risk? Uh, there, With each drink you have, there is a 10% increase in breast cancer risk. So if your risk is very low to begin with and you have a drink a day, 10% maybe is not much. But if your risk is already high or higher, and when we think about how everyone pours wine, right, we're not really pouring a glass, we're pouring a glass and a half, two glasses, so now you're up there to 20, 25%, and that's not insignificant. The amount of alcohol that someone drinks is much more important than the type of alcoholic beverage because people ask me all the time, well, if I have wine, is that better than if I have, you know, hard alcohol? No. Any amount of alcohol, any type of alcohol is considered part of this. And lastly, let's quickly touch on vitamin D and breast cancer. We have seen data that tells us that women with low levels of vitamin D have a, have a higher risk of breast cancer. And so levels of greater or equal to 30 at diagnosis are linked to a better survival from breast cancer. So this is really goes to show that even if you haven't been diagnosed with breast cancer, it's really important to be checking your vitamin D level on a regular basis and making sure that you are staying at 30 or higher. In terms of the optimal level of D, there's really not one. Um, some people, some doctors will tell you, oh, you should be at 40 or 50. We don't know, um, but we know you want to be above 30. More is not necessarily better. In terms of how you get vitamin D, we recommend vitamin D3 as a supplement over D2, and there are plant-based and vegan forms of D3. There are foods that are rich in vitamin D, specifically fatty and oily fish, um, as well as some foods that are fortified with vitamin D, but it's really, really hard to get all the vitamin D that you need from food, and so that's why um, we do recommend a supplement for pretty much everyone. In addition, um, we know that vitamin D is great for bone health and calcium absorption, our immune system, our cardiovascular health, all of the things that get affected when you undergo treatment for breast cancer. So really, really make sure that you are not deficient. 
And that is it. Uh, I, will, I think we'll do questions at the end. Okay, so save them up and I will turn the floor over to Jessica. So, um, so I'm, I'm Jessica Cording. I'm the registered dietitian and health coach here at the Valley Breast Center. Um, so my service is pretty new. We started this program officially last December to really, um, and this is just a little bit about me. Um, you know, I'm in addition to being an RD and a health coach, I'm also a certified Pilates instructor. I also have a background in communications. So I bring a little bit of all of that into the way that I work with our patients and provide a more holistic approach you know, so we work on things related to diet, exercise, lifestyle factors like stress management, sleep, other things that can make an impact on their health and well-being. Um, so the work that I do, you know, we were, um, Dr. Toplinski was talking about convenient foods and how we live in a culture of convenience. So something I'm very passionate about is helping people find ways to make healthy living convenient for them coming up with simple, sustainable approaches. So with my patients, I take a small changes approach where our patients focus on one to three sustainable changes at a time that can become the new habits that help them achieve their goals and maintain those results. So I provide not just education, but also accountability and support because it's really important to have someone checking in with you along the way and just being that person you can go to with questions. And I get asked all the time, you know, I saw this thing on the internet and it was really scary. What does it mean? Is this real? You know, I'm there to be that myth busting <laughs> voice. So Dr. Japlinski touched on this very, very well, but just to very briefly recap. You know, when it comes to the American Cancer Society guidelines for diet and physical activity, we know that it's important to reach and maintain a healthy weight over time. Also, to be physically active, um, following a healthy eating pattern. Again, we don't tell people everyone must be vegan, but we do, from a research standpoint, know that a plant-forward, oftentimes Mediterranean-style diet pattern with minimal red and processed meat, minimal added sugar, minimal fried foods and ultra-processed foods is beneficial in terms of risk reduction and also limiting alcohol. Also, really important, don't neglect sleep or stress management. You know, these have a major impact on our mental, physical, and emotional health and well-being, all of which are really important when going through treatment and navigating survivorship, whether that be in the very early days or much longer term. So I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about meal prepping. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways to streamline healthful eating and make it as convenient as possible to eat well. Um, I'm really big on making sustainable recommendations. You know, I get very frustrated when you look at you know social media and there's this 25 year old influencer telling you you know about their 10 step you know skincare routine in the morning and then they meditate for 20 minutes and then they make a beautiful bowl of oatmeal or perfectly poached eggs or you know whatever it might be and. Most of us living in the real world who are not a 25-year-old Instagram influencer have a very different morning <laughs> and day ahead. But what I will say, um, I talk a lot with my patients about how to eat healthfully when you're super busy and life is crazy. You know, it's one thing to stay in a good groove with healthy eating, exercise habits when things are calm and you have more time. But what about when you're really busy or you're going through an emotionally challenging time? So I really like incorporating some meal prepping or batch cooking into the week to save time, money, energy. It's also helpful for staying on track with healthy eating habits that support your individual nutrition needs and wellness goals, especially when life gets real, as I like to say. So just a few of my favorite meal prep strategies that I share with, with my patients and that I practice in my own life as well. Just washing and chopping a bunch of produce for later use, roasting several sheet pans of vegetables, I'm a big believer that if I'm gonna turn on the oven to make one thing, I may as well make a bunch of things. Um, and just preparing easy proteins. So that can be things like beans, hard boiled eggs. Um, again, we do like to remind our patients that soy in its whole form is not just okay in moderation, but can be protective. So baked tofu or tempeh are awesome for meal prep. Of course, you can do grilled chicken. Um, I didn't put it on this list, but I'm also, because you're not exactly preparing it necessarily, but I'm a really big fan of incorporating um, convenient forms of the oily, nutrient-dense fish, like sardines, canned salmon, canned tuna. They all count, too, towards your vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acid intake. 
Um, you could also make a big batch of your favorite whole grains, or you know that could be something like brown rice, or make a big batch of oatmeal that you can put toppings on later. Um, I'm a huge fan of making a big pot of soup and or chili for the week ahead. Um, preparing simple salad dressings or a healthy hummus or dip for the week, that's a really nice way to add flavor without having to rely on some of the more processed forms that are available. And of course, don't forget breakfast, snacks, <laughs> treats. Um, you know, uh, we're really big fans of it, like an 80-20, 85-15 approach to healthful eating, where the majority of what you're eating is that healthful, nourishing stuff, but with a little bit of room for pleasure, because that's really important, too, and key for sustainability when it comes to healthy eating. Um, so I know we will save questions for the end, but I have a little food demo for you guys featuring one of my favorite healthy plant-based recipes that's super easy to make. So let's work on that. Okay, so tonight we're making a medi um, marinated white bean salad. You know, so we, I was mentioning earlier that a Mediterranean style diet has been shown to be protective. Um, one of my favorite, you know, I, so I'm, I'm Greek, Italian, Turkish, like I could eat that food all day, every day. Um, and I think I do. But um, one of the things I really love about cuisine from that part of the world is that they make really good use of legumes. So beans, peas, lentils. Um, I particularly love white beans for meal prepping or I incorporate them into so many kinds of dishes because they're, they've got a very mild flavor that, that plays well with so many different kinds of other foods. They've got a nice creamy texture. Um, they're also really high in fiber, which helps us stay full. It's good for digestion, which is very important for immune system function, um, as well as, you know, there's more research now and now on the mind-body connection and the gut-brain communication, how that's important. Um, also a good source of plant-based protein. So they're also not very high in calories. So for people who are being mindful of um, keeping their calorie intake in a good place to support a weight maintenance or weight loss goal, beans are very convenient because you get a lot of nutrient bang for your buck. Um, so one of the ways to make foods that are fairly simple like beans, you know, incorporating really nice accents. So I'm gonna start with just this, you got some simple white beans. Literally all this is, is a 15 ounce can of cannellini beans, rinsed really well and dumped in a, dumped in a bowl. Um, if you're watching your sodium intake, I would recommend getting no salt added beans or you can also make your own beans in a pressure cooker or boil them on the stove and not add any salt. That's another great way to incorporate a no salt or low salt version. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a nice dressing. So I like to, um, I, well, surprise, surprise, I told you guys I was Italian. I love olive oil. I put it on everything. Um, you know, olive oil is really high in heart healthy mono and saturated fats. So I generally recommend my patients use avocado oil or olive oil as their main cooking oils. Olive oil is going to give you a really nice, rich flavor that's, again, very versatile. So we're starting with just a tablespoon of olive oil to make this recipe. Um, I have some red wine vinegar. This is just the citrus, or not the citrus, but the, the acidity adds a little brightness. Sometimes when people say that like healthy food is kind of boring, a lot of it has to do with not having enough seasoning, not enough contrast with the flavors. So a little bit of vinegar goes a really long way to add some brightness. So I'm going to add that to the olive oil. Um, and then some lemon juice. Like I have a major sour tooth, so if you do not, you can omit this one. But again, I just like the, the little bit of extra acidity and that different like lemony flavor. That's very Mediterranean to me. It's also a really nice way to work in some vitamin C, which is good for our immune system function, as well as um, you know collagen production in our skin. So lots, of, and it's also an antioxidant. So. Um, vitamin C is something we can get from a lot of vegetables and fruits. So any way we can be incorporating food sources. Again, um, Dr. Toplinski was saying, you're just focusing on getting lots of plants into your diet. So I would say just put lots of plants on the plate. All right, so we have our olive oil, our vinegar, our lemon juice. I'm also gonna add some garlic. This one is optional. Um, one of, I will say, one of the few bright spots of the pandemic, I appreciate that the masks make it a little bit less scary to eat garlic at lunch. Um, honestly, when we eventually may not have to wear masks anymore, I'll probably just keep it up anyway and just, you know. But 
keeps the vampires away. It's also good for our heart health. Adds a, a nice flavor. But again, if you don't like garlic or it upsets your stomach or you are a little more shy about breathing on people um, than I am, then you can skip the garlic. Um, but then I'm gonna also add just, right here I, I added a, a variety of spices, just kind of a sofrito blend. Um, but you can keep it super simple, just a little bit of like, again, sea salt, some pepper. Um, I also added red pepper flakes. If you don't like the heat, totally fine to skip it. But I think spices are really important and underutilized in the standard American diet. So I just would encourage, and I talk with this, um, I talk about this with my patients, is tuning into the flavors that really speak to you and what's really going to make food enjoyable. You know, the 30 seconds it takes you to grab some spices from your cabinet is going to upgrade your healthy meals so, so much. It is totally worth it. So we're going to add that in there. All right, so I wanted to bring these containers today for my little mise en place um, because when it comes to healthy eating on the go, if you're packing a lunch, I know you guys were given lunch boxes. Um, having the right equipment to make it convenient to carry healthy food with you is going to simplify your life so much. So I really like for, for salad dressings, for example, you know, what I would normally do is bring a little leak proof container and then you can put that on your salad right before you eat it so that you're not worrying about your salad dripping all over your lunch bag. Um, but so, but it also doubles as a little mixing bowl. <laughs> so we're going to just mix up our dressing. Now I also brought some um, sun-dried tomatoes. Again, just a little pop of flavor goes a long way. So uh, these, these tiny little accents that are super simple, just really upgraded dish. Um, I also chopped up some fresh basil. You could use parsley, you could use um, cilantro for a different flavor, you could use oregano. You could also use the dried versions of your favorite spices too, your favorite herbs. But I basil, I was able to find some really nice basil at the market, so going for it. All right, so we're gonna add that in. All right, so now we have our dressing. All right, and all we're really gonna do is just pour this over our white beans. Toss that really well. Yeah, so as you can see, you know, plain beans by themselves are not that exciting. It's just a bunch of beige stuff in a bowl. And I can understand, you know, if you open that up and, you know, that's supposed to be your lunch, it's like, oh, great, okay. But when you see the different, you know, you smell the different aromas, you see the different colors of the different ingredients. It's a much different experience. So, you know, what, what I would do with this is, I really love to pair this with some leafy greens. You know, in the, in the summer months, you know, this would be really nice over just some seasonal leafy greens and enjoy it as a cold salad. In the cooler months, you know, you could do this with something heartier like massaged kale. Um, you know, when you, when you massage kale with like some kind of acid like lemon juice or vinegar, um, maybe you incorporate some olive oil in there, it, it starts to break down those tough cell walls and it makes the kale a little bit easier to chew, a little bit easier to eat. Um, you could also pair this with roasted vegetables. I love this with roasted broccoli, roasted cauliflower, a mix of both. Um, you could put, you know, fresh tomatoes. You could put roasted peppers. I, I, I love eggplant. I could eat it every day. Um, roasted eggplant would be really great in this. But for something a little bit different, you could also, um, you know, pair this. You know, I've had people do it, like, on toast. Um, and if you're looking at this, you're like, you know, like, the beans look great, but I, that's not enough for me. I need more protein. I'm glad you, glad you mentioned that. Um, so again, we were talking about how a plant-forward diet does not have to mean vegan. You know, some of my favorite ways to amp up the protein a little bit with this might be to add either a poached egg or a hard-boiled egg, which is very lunchbox friendly. Um, you could also put some grilled chicken on there. Um, grilled shrimp would be really nice. And I mentioned earlier that I really like um, canned sardines. Of course, me being me, I love the, the ones that are packed in olive oil. Because <laughs> again, that nice flavor, those really healthy fats. Um, you could do canned tuna. It's really great mixed with beans and herbs. So a lot of different options. Um, and if you want to add a little bit of like something more like salty notes or something a little savory, this is also very nice with some olives added in there or a little bit of feta cheese or goat cheese, Parmesan, you know, things that are very flavorful. I like to give my patients a formula that I call the overthink-proof plate. 
So I will say there are so many things in life that are complicated and that we are prone to overthinking. You know, our, our, what we're eating should not have to be that complicated. So my version of the overthink proof plate that I like to share is to fill half your plate or bowl with non-starchy veggies. So that could be your leafy greens or things like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, zucchini, all that colorful stuff. Um, and then a quarter of your plate, some kind of protein, whether it's coming from an animal source, like poultry, eggs, um, fish, you know, maybe we would put, if you are eating some, you know, some cheese in there, that might occupy that space. Um, and then of course that could also be a plant-based protein like tofu, tempeh. Um, I, I love doing things like baked tempeh with dishes like this, um, or, you know, adding some hemp seeds, which are very high in protein. Um, or, and you know, I think it's really important just to tune into what's satisfying to you and what makes you feel well. You know, that's something we don't talk enough about, I think. It's so much of what we should be doing and not enough about what actually helps me feel like I'm thriving. Um, and then, so you have that last quarter of the plate. Um, and again, you know, for some people, they feel best if they have maybe a quarter of that plate is some kind of carbohydrate source. Ideally, one of the more high fiber sources like a whole grain or a starchy vegetable like sweet potato or corn. Um, but I do tend to encourage, just in terms of feeling satisfied and energized, fat is really important. And you guys have heard me talk a lot about how much I love olive oil. <laughs> but um, have, I would say as a general rule of thumb, incorporating some healthy fat into each of our meals. So, you know, with this Overthink Proof plate, that might be an eighth of your plate being some kind of fat. So whether that is cooking with olive oil or avocado oil or garnishing with a little bit of nuts or seeds just for a little extra something. Uh, that could be adding some sliced avocado. Or if you're using cheese just as a garnish, you know, it could occupy that space too and you're just using a tiny bit. Um, and then again, that last eighth of the plate, some kind of carbohydrate source. So I would say, you know, again, go for what feels satisfying to you. And, you know, I see, I see sometimes people like, oh, well, I heard that that thing's real, you know, I heard the quinoa is really good for me and I should eat it, but I hate it. If you hate quinoa, you don't have to eat quinoa. So, or if you love quinoa and you're like, shut up, don't pick on quinoa, you know, then insert whatever grain you dislike or whatever carb is not your thing. Or, you know, if you know that you really want to have a treat after dinner, you know, then maybe instead of having that, that carb serving at your dinner, then maybe you're like, no, I'm gonna have this, you know, this fruit or this piece of chocolate or this special cookie that my partner made. You know, I think it's really important to really do what works for you. We're all different and there are all, we all have slightly different needs, different preferences, but big picture, healthful eating can be flexible and it can work for any of us. So I hope you enjoyed this recipe. Again, super simple, easy to modify, depending on your favorite beans, your favorite spices, what you wanna pair it with. But I just wanted to share something just to show that healthy eating and meal prepping can be simple and enjoyable. Thank you. I do have some questions here uh, for our panelists to answer. So one of which is, um, what are your thoughts about the imitation um, meat products now that are plant-based? Are they considered um, processed? Are they acceptable um, replacements for meals? We love this question. Um, so yes, these you know uh, plant-based meat alternatives. You know what we like about them is that they can be a, a good stepping stone, or for somebody who might be really new to incorporating more plant-based proteins, you know, they can be an approachable way to kind of dip your toes in. But that said, they do tend to be very processed. So going back to what Dr. Japlinski was saying about how just because something is vegan does not automatically mean that it's healthy, I think it's really important to read the ingredients labels, see what's in there, um, and also, um, it's important to keep in mind too. What are you pairing that that meat alternative product with? You know, what are you putting on that that burger or that you know plant based veggie dog or you know what kind of toppings are you using or mixins? So, you know, we think there are some benefits and there's some research being done to look at what those potential benefits are when compared to red meat, for example. But we still consider them a processed food, so encourage limiting them and enjoying them in moderation. Another question 
is does having a father with prostate cancer um, lead to an increased, re increased risk of breast cancer? So that, that's a great question. So we get asked all the time, you know, I have a family member with this cancer, I have a father with prostate cancer, I have a mother with ovarian cancer, you know, what have you, and what is my risk? And, you know, honestly, that's not a question we can answer in 30 seconds because there's so many other factors that go into it. So, for example, for prostate cancer, the type of prostate cancer matters. So we're looking at something called the Gleason score. In general, though, when you think about family history, is it a first degree relative, so parent or a sibling? Is it a second degree relative, a grandparent, an, um, you know, an aunt, an uncle? And then how many people in that family have had cancer? So that matters as well. So you have to put it all together. But what we always tell patients is that if there is a question, we want everyone to see genetics. So we have a Valley, a fantastic genetic program, um, some multiple genetic counselors. They will take the most comprehensive family history you have ever had. And then they will tell you, okay, yes, you're eligible for testing. And then this is the panel testing that we recommend. So when in doubt, always, always, always see a genetic counselor because that's going to be the best assessment of your risk that, that can be determined. There were some talks before about charred food and um, cancer. Is there definitely a link between the two? Uh, question about charred food or grilled food and barbecue, right? So we love barbecue in the summer. About 2015 or so, a big study came out, looked at a, a population, I believe, in Long Island. And they said, hey, barbecue food is not good for you, right? So you can imagine the uproar that this created because uh, everyone loves to grill in the summer. But the, the point is that it had when you start barbecuing food and if you're doing it daily, it's high uh, smoke points or high temperatures that you're cooking the food at. And there has been some link with carcinogens. That does not mean you shouldn't barbecue, but maybe you're not throwing stuff on the grill every night in the summer, that kind of thing. You mentioned um, olive oil before, avocado oil. What oils are best for cooking versus used for salad dressings, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of a lot of it has to do with you know the high like how high of a heat are you cooking that food to, or also what kind of texture are you going for. You know, interestingly, um, it was thought for a number of years that olive oil was better used for lower temperature cooking. Um, more recent research has shown that you can still cook with it at higher temperatures. Um, I think up to about 450 degrees Fahrenheit, um, whereas. Um, you know, avocado oil, you can cook it more to like 500 degrees Fahrenheit. It has a little bit of a higher smoke point, so it might be better suited for high heat cooking, like um, like frying, higher heat sauteing, stir frying. Um, olive oil, though, you can still use it for a lot of those applications. But, you know, some of some people, for example, like I wouldn't recommend deep frying in olive oil, but big picture, I wouldn't really recommend deep frying in general. So, um, but with olive oil, I would say, you know, it's very versatile for, you know, because it has a lot of flavor. Um, it is very good for use in things like salad dressings or marinades where you're really going to get that flavor. And then avocado oil, you know, that's really great for, again, the high heat cooking methods or for things where you want a more neutral flavor um, or for baked goods. You know, if you are um, wanting to use a healthier cooking oil than um, some of the other, you know, like then like corn oil or, you know, vegetable oil. Um, the avocado oil is a great option because it's very neutral in flavor and it will still give you a really nice texture. Sometimes, you know, and again, I get questions a lot, well, what about coconut oil? And, you know, I, I always joke that coconut oil has a really good PR team because, you know, it, it, even though it's a slightly different form of saturated fat, which is one that we're generally encouraged to, to limit a bit more than the, the unsaturated fats, you know, I still, it did have this like health halo around it for a while. And I do see that sometimes. But if you're watching your saturated fat intake out of respect for, um, you know, supporting heart health, you still want to be mindful of how much coconut oil you're consuming. So I typically will encourage, you know, my patients who do want to be using coconut oil to kind of treat it like butter, where, you know, it's got a very specific taste, texture. So, you know, if you're making a baked good where you really want that um, that specific mouthfeel or maybe you want that coconut flavor, you know, as an in moderation thing, I can think it can be fine. But generally speaking, you know, olive oil and avocado oil can both be used um, pretty much interchangeably. But just depending on, you know, for the really high heat stuff, avocado oil, 
Um, but if you really want the olive oil flavor for things, you know, it's good where you're going to be tasting it more. So there's a long answer to a very short and sweet, but great question. Thank you. Another question here. Is a diagnosis of atypical breast disease considered precancerous? There are a number of high-risk lesions that are found in the breast that are not necessarily precancerous. Um, the only thing to date that we believe is a precancer is a percentage of ductal carcinoma in situ, which we call an obligate precursor, that if you leave it there long enough, that it will become an invasive cancer. Um, again, that's a small percentage. Atypical duct hyperplasia, lobular carcinoma in situ, atypical lobular hyperplasia in general are found in the breast that are causing some of these early signs on screening, like calcification or distortions, and they're found in the milieu of the tissue in the area. They're not necessarily creating that finding. And when we find those things, we know that patients are at an increased lifetime risk for breast cancer, up to about 30%, depending on which one of the findings. Now, the reason behind, or the rationale behind recommending surgical excision of those lesions is not to remove the thing that will one day become a cancer, but to better sample the surrounding breast tissue. If you remember the slide that I showed where it was a progression in the ductal cells of increasing number of funny looking or atypical cells, some of this is diagnosed by the amount, the quantity, as well as the quality of how it looks on a slide. But there are very different genetic changes that are happening in those cells. So having one does not mean at all the atypical duct hyperplasia that if you leave it there that it will progress to a breast cancer. For those patients who have finished their treatment, um, do you recommend um, them receiving their COVID-19 booster shots and is there a timeline or a time frame for that? Uh, so the COVID booster is very controversial. I, I don't want to say controversial, but unlike when we knew with the vaccine, we definitely wanted everyone to get it, that the recommendations for the booster are a little bit vague. And so right now, what is recommended is that if, so if you were immunosuppressed when you got your first dose or second dose, you were on chemotherapy, you were recovering maybe from radiation or surgery, we definitely want everyone to get a third dose because the thought is that maybe you didn't mount the best immune response that you could could have when you had your first or second dose. If that does, if you don't have fall into that category and you've had your doses again more than six months previously, if you're over 65, that booster is recommended for everybody. If you're younger than 65 and you have chronic medical conditions, and so this is where it gets tricky because cancer technically falls into that category. But if you had cancer, if you just finished treatment, yes, we'd want a booster. If you let's say we're treated two years ago and you're maybe just on an aromatase inhibitor, well, technically you're not really immunosuppressed. So that's where it gets a little, there's no clear recommendations. And that's a really personal decision amongst between you and your doctor and your team. And I would urge anyone, if you're not sure if you should get a booster, call either your oncologist, your primary care doctor, your OBGYN, whoever is your kind of person that you run these things by and have that conversation with them. But we know that the booster is safe, and so all the data points to that, so there shouldn't be any concern from that perspective. Uh, another question here, it says, uh, regarding inflammation uh, being um, bad for breast cancer, um, what about some grains or vegetables like um, tomatoes or some other um, food that um, are controversial in stating that they cause some inflammation? Are there any foods to avoid? So there's, if you, I always joke that the internet is like the wild west of health information. Um, and when, especially when it comes to diet, um, you know, and if you Google diet inflammation, like you will get a giant, giant list. And sometimes it's hard to tell what's, what's credible, what's research based, what's not. Um, you know, from a research standpoint, you know, I, I think some of what those questions were at, like the tomatoes and, and such, um, I don't know if you were talking about nightshade vegetables, you know, that's a little bit, um, you know, the data is mixed on that. Um, what we do know from an inflammation standpoint that um, incorporating a lot of like the added sugars, very processed foods, you know, red, red and processed meat, you know, those are things that we have 
more data on in terms of inflammation. Um, you know, and there's a lot of controversy in this area, but I would always encourage that if you are overthinking something or if you are wondering like, oh my goodness, like is this, is what I'm eating causing inflammation, you know, or it's something that, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot about, but you're not sure if the information is credible, please, you know, give us a call. Like I'm, I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to talk to you. Um, or obviously if you're not a patient with Valley, you know, talk to your healthcare provider or see if you can get connected with a registered dietitian, somebody with a... A, a, a licensed healthcare professional who can address your question better than um, the internet and hopefully put your mind at ease and help you feel like you're making empowered, informed decisions. Um, what canned fishes um, are better than others? Yeah, that's a great question. What I tend to look for, so I, I tend to look for things that are packed in extra virgin olive oil. You know, I would say read the label and see what is in there. You know, some companies will use oils that may not have as many health-promoting properties. So I, I tend to look for the extra virgin olive oil. Um, I tend to favor wild fish as well, um, just a little bit. And the smaller fish, so like what's really good about small fish like sardines, for example, you know, they have less mercury. And sometimes if you're having too much of some of these bigger fish like tuna, salmon, you know, there is some risk of mercury toxicity. And that would be like if you were eating it every single day. You know, if you're eating it a few times a week, it is not, not, a, not a big deal. But um, I would say mixing it up, you know. Um, and also, too, if you're watching your salt intake, of course, you know, pay attention to how much sodium is in there. And, um, you know, but I think as well, I would say prioritize the healthy fats like olive oil or packed in water if you don't want to do a, a, an oilier version. And you know, just be mindful of the sodium intake as well as any, you know, additives that might be in there that you don't want in there. But I would say keep it simple, like fish, oil, salt, or fish, spring water, salt, you know, it would be what my, my top pick for that. Um, are there any healthy foods that also relieve stress? Oh, well, we, we could talk about this for hours and hours. <laughs> it's one of my favorite topics. You know, this idea of the f food mood connection and nutritional psychiatry, there's a whole field that, um, you know, that we could barely scratch the surface of. But I will say some of the foods that, from a research standpoint, you know, that we do have some data on that are in terms of stress relief, you know, incorporate into a healthful diet. You know, um, I think big picture, blood sugar management is really important. So making sure that at your meals and snacks, you're having a good balance of protein, fat, and complex carbohydrate. If our blood sugar is all over the place because we're either eating too many carbs or the portions of our carbohydrates are too large compared to the protein and fat we're having, or we're eating too much added sugar, you know, if our blood sugar is kind of going up and down all day on like a glue coaster, you know, glucose roller coaster, it's really hard to be resilient in the face of stress. You know, our energy, our mood are going to suffer. So it's a big picture, stabilize your blood sugar by having balanced meals and snacks. Um, but in terms of specific foods, um, we have research, again, healthy fats like olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds. Um, so, and then the oily fish come back. The omega-3 fatty acids in oily fish like salmon, tuna, sardines. Um, oysters aren't super oily, but they have a lot too. Um, omega-3 fatty acids coming from these animal sources have been shown to help mitigate the effects of stress hormone cortisol in studies. Um, that said, there are plant forms of omega-3s, so like ground flax, um, you, it needs to be ground so your body can absorb it. But then you also have chia seeds, almonds, walnuts, um, certain like leafy vegetables have a little bit. Um, leafy greens are also very, have been shown to be helpful for a number of reasons. Um, we have a lot of research on berries. I would say we probably have the most research on blueberries, but honestly, they're all good. The um, anthocyanins, these pigments that give them those beautiful colors are part of the um, antioxidants that are thought to be very helpful with um, offsetting the cellular damage related to stress. But from a more just you know immediate standpoint, berries, they have a lot of fiber, they're colorful, they're sweet, you know, they're very, um, they're very satisfying. So I think that's another reason they can help. Um, so we have some data on, um, you know, incorporating like lots of herbs and spices. Um, I would also say too, just making sure you're getting enough fiber. So making sure that the grains you're eating are whole grains, ideally. You know, things like beans, legumes, very important as well. Um, 
And dairy is very controversial. You know, the um, and Dr. Tafunsky and I talk about this a lot. Like the the research on dairy and cancer is so mixed. You know, so we typically will tell our patients that dairy in moderation is okay, but again, you want to be mindful um, that when you're choosing dairy, you know, it's the the less processed stuff. You know, minimal sugar, if any. Um, and I bring that up because there is some research looking at, a lot of research looking at the state of our gastrointestinal system and our stress response and our mood and cognition. And so there is some research suggesting that, you know, if you are eating dairy, you know, making sure that it's fermented dairy, like, you know, yogurt. I like to recommend the Greek yogurt because it's very high in protein, which is very satiating. Um, so I would say like yogurt, um, but also kefir, which is even lower in lactose. For So, so for people who maybe don't tolerate most other dairy, might find that they do okay with a little bit of kefir, which is like a liquid yogurt. Um, so that's just scratching the surface of some of the foods that have been shown so far to be helpful for stress response. And you know, I'm curious to see what else we're going to learn along the way too. There's much more to come there. <laughs> are there any chronic conditions that are linked to breast cancer? I, I'm not really aware of any um, that would increase your risk. You know, again, I mean, I will say obesity, which is a medical condition that will increase your risk for breast cancer, but that's kind of the only thing that's popping up. I think people were asking more about other maybe medical diagnoses. We know that those are not linked. However, the important point is that cardiovascular disease and breast cancer do share many risk factors in common. And we know that more breast cancer survivors are actually dying of heart disease than they are of breast cancer. So managing that risk in terms of breast cancer is really going to help manage your cardiovascular risk as well. If someone just joined the Lifestyles Gym, would they still be eligible to take advantage of the PrEP program? Yes. Yes. So the answer is yes to that. So the question was, what are the benefits of organic versus inorganic Fruits, vegetables. So there's there's a few things that come up. So one of the big things is pesticide exposure. You know that's a very hot topic. Um, you know so what I typically will encourage is you know for stuff like uh, that has a very like thick peel or you're not eating the outside. Um, you know I would recommend that it's it's okay to buy conventional for things like avocados, bananas. You know where you're not eating like the outside or but things with like a lot of like, little like nooks and crannies where um you know uh, pesticides for example you know might be more likely to sink in you know that's something i would say if someone is trying to limit exposure just out of concern for that you know that could be one thing to keep in mind um the environmental working group they publish every year um a dirty dozen list and a clean 15 list that share uh which foods are which produce, you know, fruits and vegetables are best purchased organic and which ones are okay to buy conventional. Um, but another topic that comes up sometimes with organic versus in, like conventionally grown is um, nutrient value. And that's something, you know, um, we, I would say the data is very mixed on that. A lot of it really depends on seasonality and how long, um, you know, that particular food has been, you know, sitting like, on you know on the, the shelf in the store in your fridge at home, you know I sometimes am asked um, you know I want to buy all organic but like it's really expensive or I can't get organic foods in the winter time you know of the stuff that I like so that's when I'll recommend well you know how about you buy um, organic frozen produce because a lot of those uh, foods when they're harvested they're frozen right away so a lot of the antioxidants vitamins and minerals like a lot of the the good stuff you know it's kind of frozen in there so that way you don't lose that nutrient value as opposed to if it's sitting on the shelf for a really long time because those berries had to come all the way from like halfway across the world or you know thousands of miles away um you know it's a little bit more accessible so that's just a few things from my perspective i don't know if you guys have anything to add yeah it's a great question a history of a benign breast mass, like a fibroadenoma. Are there any studies out there that there is an increased chance of malignant mass in the breast? People say this all the time, you know, the thought when somebody has a fibroadenoma, you know, I'm, am I at risk that this is going to turn into breast cancer? I tell them, no. However, is there a chance that there could be a cancer that develops alongside of it or next to it? 
that is the same risk as any other woman has. Um, the problem is, is fibroadenomas occur and other benign diseases of the breast occur in predominantly fibrocystic type breasts. And there is data to show that fibrocystic type breasts do carry an increased risk for breast cancer. However, that increased risk is small. And it's not the only factor. It's all of the things that we've been speaking about here tonight, about obesity, alcohol intake, exercise, diet. So if you have fibrocystic type breast, which may increase your lifetime risk by 1.2%, the other factors, the other diet and lifestyle factors are also important. Um, but the thing itself does not, the thing itself does not turn into cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein, Dr. Toplinski, and Jessica for your informative presentation this evening. If you are interested in future Valley Live events, please visit www.valleyhealth.com events for upcoming programs. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening.